You're about to hear Two Minute Apologetics with John Martinoni, President of the Bible Christian Society. John, why do Catholics confess their sins to a priest rather than going directly to God? Because that's the way God set things up for us to receive His forgiveness. In James 5.16, God, through sacred scripture, commands us to confess our sins to one another. Scripture does not say confess your sins straight to God and only to God. It says confess your sins to one another. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 6, Jesus tells us that he was given authority on earth to forgive sins. And then Scripture proceeds to tell us in verse 8 that this authority was given to men, plural. In John 20, verse 21, Jesus says to his disciples, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. How did the Father send Jesus? Well, we just saw in Matthew 9 that the Father sent Jesus with the authority on earth to forgive sins. Now Jesus sends out his disciples as the Father has sent him. So what authority must Jesus be sending his disciples out with? The authority on earth to forgive sins. And listen to the next two verses. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Why would Jesus give the apostles the power to forgive or retain sins if he wasn't expecting folks to confess their sins to them? That's crazy. And how could they forgive or retain sins if no one was confessing their sins to them? The Bible tells us to confess our sins to one another. It also tells us that God gave men the authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus sends out his disciples with the authority on earth to forgive sins. When Catholics confess our sins to a priest, we are simply following the plan laid down by Jesus Christ. He forgives sins through the priest. It is God's power, but he exercises that power through the ministry of the priest. What does the word apologetics mean? The word apologetics is derived from an ancient Greek word apologia or apologia, which means an apology. Not an apology in the modern sense of the word, which is to say you're sorry for something, but rather an apology in the ancient sense of the word, which is to make a reasoned defense of something or someone. In ancient times, the word apology referred to the case a lawyer would make on behalf of his client. So apologetics is about building the case for our faith, learning how to explain and defend our faith. Basically, there are three types of apologetics, natural, Christian, and Catholic. Natural apologetics builds the case for truths that we can know from the natural light of reason, truths that are able to be known without any divine intervention, truths such as the existence of God, the innate spirituality of the human soul, the objective reality of right and wrong, truths which the articles of our faith rest upon and build upon. Christian apologetics, on the other hand, builds the case for divinely revealed truths, truths that cannot be known by reason apart from faith, truths such as the reality of biblical miracles, the divinity of Christ, the virgin birth, and the resurrection, to name a few. Catholic apologetics encompasses all of Christian apologetics since Catholicism is the fullness of Christianity, but Catholic apologetics tends to focus on those truths of Christianity that are not generally believed by non-Catholic Christians. Truths such as the Catholic Church having been founded by Jesus Christ, the papacy, the sacraments, the Immaculate Conception, and others. Again, the three main types of apologetics are natural, Christian, and Catholic. And in this course, we will be focusing mainly on Catholic apologetics, how to explain and defend the truths of our Catholic faith. Are there any basic rules for doing apologetics? 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to make a defense. Always be prepared, Scripture tells us. How can we always be prepared to make a defense of our faith? Rule number one, pray. Pray to the Holy Spirit that He give you the courage to share your faith and the wisdom to choose your words carefully and profitably. Rule number two, you don't have to know everything right now. Learn a little bit more about your faith each and every day. Read Scripture. Read the Catechism. Listen to apologetics tapes. Listen to Catholic radio. Learn a little bit at a time. Rule number three, Luke 5, verse 10. Do not be afraid. Henceforth, you will be catching men. Jesus said this to Peter, but he's also saying it to us. Will you make mistakes and get into tight spots when you start sharing your faith with others? Yes, of course you will. But Peter made mistakes, and he got into tight spots. Yet Jesus told Peter not to be afraid. Why? Because if we are sincere in our desire to share the truth with others, to share Jesus Christ with others, then Jesus will find a way to make good come from even our mistakes. Rule number four, always view a question about your faith or even an attack on your faith as an opportunity, an opportunity 
to share the truth. Rule number five, don't get frustrated. Catholics often get frustrated by what I call the doctrinal dance. You get asked about purgatory, Mary, the Pope, the sacraments, all in rapid fire succession. Before you can answer one question, you're asked another, then another. Just keep bringing the discussion back to one topic until you've said all you want to say, then move on. Rule number six, never be afraid to say, I don't know, when asked a question about your faith. Don't try to wing it. However, always follow I don't know with, but I will find out and get back to you, and make sure you do. What should I keep in mind when I'm trying to defend my faith? Well, number one, ingrain this into your psyche. The Bible is a Catholic book. The Catholic Church gave it to the world, which means there is nothing, nothing in the Bible that is contrary to anything in the Catholic faith, and there is nothing in the Catholic faith that is contrary to anything in the Bible. Always remember that. This is important to remember because a lot of times folks will quote a passage from the Bible that proves the Catholic Church is wrong. Whenever someone quotes you a Bible verse that proves the Catholic Church is wrong on something, your response should be, Amen. I believe what the Bible says. As a Catholic, I believe everything the Bible says. However, I don't agree with your personal and fallible interpretation of that passage. And the reason you don't agree with their personal interpretation is because 100% of the time you're presented with a verse that proves the Catholic Church wrong, that verse has either A, been taken out of context, or B, the verse simply doesn't say what they're trying to make it say. Number two, and this flows directly from number one, the Catholic Church can be defended solely from the Bible better than any other Christian faith tradition can be. A good bit in the various Protestant faith traditions actually contradicts the Bible, so do not be afraid to engage non-Catholics in a discussion of the Bible. And number three, if you are ever asked a question about your faith that you cannot answer, don't worry. There is an answer for that question. You just need to go and find it. Simply respond, I don't know, but I will find out and get back to you. Then find out and get back to them. As Catholics, we need to reclaim the Bible. It's our book. We need to read it, pray it, learn it, and use it to bring our separated brothers and sisters back to the church. If you keep these things in mind, you have started down the road to being a very effective apologist for the Catholic faith. I have some friends who are Catholic who say that you don't have to believe everything that the church teaches, whether it's in the catechism or not. Is that true? No, it's not true. If you want to call yourself Catholic, but you want to pick and choose for yourself which of the church's teachings to accept and which to reject, you give everyone else who calls himself Catholic the right to do the same thing. For example, you believe women should be priests. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1577, it states, Only a baptized man validly receives ordination. For this reason, the ordination of women is not possible. You don't believe that. Well, that's fine. I just made this a catechism of your Catholic Church, but not mine. But remember, if you can throw doctrines out, so can everyone else who calls himself Catholic. That gives Joe Parishioner over at St. Doubting Thomas Catholic Church the right to throw out the church's social justice teachings. He doesn't feel like feeding the hungry, caring for the poor, and all that other bleeding heart stuff. Paragraphs 2401 to 2463. I just made this a catechism of his Catholic Church, but not mine. You believe contraception is okay. Paragraph 2370 says contraception is intrinsically evil. Joe Parishioner doesn't like what the church teaches on the death penalty. Paragraphs 2364 to 65. You don't like what it teaches on these pages, pages 505 to 508. He doesn't like what it teaches on these other pages here, pages 610 to 615. Can you see what's happening? I heard it said once that there is a shortage of vocations to the priesthood in the United States, but no shortage of vocations to the papacy. If we don't believe in all of it, if we each appoint ourselves Pope and throw out a doctrine here or a doctrine there, then our faith is no longer Catholic. I had a friend ask me why Catholics have crucifixes in our churches. Don't we believe Jesus has risen? Why do we keep him on the cross? Well, first of all, you want to check out 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. Paul says, but we preach Christ crucified. Why does Paul preach Christ crucified? Doesn't he know Jesus has been raised from the dead? Well, of course he does. But he knows that it is through the power of the crucified Christ on the cross that the bonds of sin and death are broken. As he says in verse 24, Christ crucified is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Again, didn't Paul know that Jesus had risen from the dead? Well, of course he did. Paul preaches Christ crucified because an empty cross has no power. 
The cross that bears the beaten, battered, and bloodied body of Jesus Christ, however, that cross is the power of God. So we keep Jesus on the cross because we too preach Christ crucified. And the crucifix reminds us not only of God's power, but also his love for us, giving his only begotten son up for death and suffering. Also, here in this life, we do not share so much in the glory of the resurrection as we do in the suffering of Jesus on the cross. After all, we must take up our cross daily if we are to follow Jesus, as it says in Luke 9, verse 23. And we must die with Christ in order to live with him, as Romans 6, 8 tells us. Where did Christ die? On the cross. One other passage to keep in mind is Galatians 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Did you catch that? Jesus was publicly portrayed before their eyes as being crucified. Sounds kind of like they may have been looking at a crucifix, doesn't it? I had a theology professor who told me that Adam and Eve were just myths and that the rest of Genesis was all just legend. Is that what the church teaches? Absolutely not. The church has always taught that Adam and Eve were real people and were the first human beings from whom all other human beings are descended. In 1950, Pope Pius XII in the encyclical Humani Generis states, The faithful cannot embrace the opinion that after Adam there existed on this earth true men who did not take their origin through natural generation from Adam or that Adam represents a certain number of first parents. In other words, the church teaches that all humanity descended from Adam and Eve. They were real people. Paragraph 38. This encyclical, in fact, clearly points out the first 11 chapters of Genesis do nevertheless pertain to history in a true sense. Again, Adam and Eve are not myths, and the rest of Genesis is not legend. Genesis is history in a true sense. Paragraph 39. Therefore, whatever of the popular narrations have been inserted into the sacred scriptures must in no way be considered on a par with myths or other such things. Can it be stated any clearer than that? The Catechism says, paragraph 375, The Church teaches that our first parents, Adam and Eve, no mention of a myth here, paragraph 404, by yielding to the tempter, Adam and Eve committed a personal sin. Someone please tell me how do myths commit personal sins. Adam and Eve's are not myths. Genesis does not contain myth or legend. That is church teaching. Challenge anyone who teaches differently to produce their sources from a magisterial document. They can't do it. They can, however, produce countless books and articles by theologians. Not good enough. A friend of mine said that his church takes the Bible literally, but that the Catholic Church doesn't. Is that true? Catholics actually interpret the Bible in a literal sense, while many fundamentalists, evangelicals, and others interpret the Bible in a literalist sense. The literal meaning of a passage of Scripture is the meaning the author of that passage of Scripture intended to convey. The literalist interpretation of a passage of Scripture is, that's what it says, that's what it means. Here's an example to illustrate the difference. If you were to read a passage in a book that said it was raining cats and dogs outside, how would you interpret that? As Americans in the 21st century, we know that the author was intending to convey the idea that it was raining pretty doggone hard outside. That would be the literal or Catholic interpretation. The literalist interpretation would be that were you to walk outside, you would actually see cats and dogs falling from the sky like rain. No taking into account the popularly accepted meaning of this phrase. No taking into account what the author was intending to convey. The words say it was raining cats and dogs, so by golly, it was raining cats and dogs. That is the literalist or fundamentalist way of interpretation. Now, if someone 2,000 years in the future picked up that same book and read it was raining cats and dogs outside, in order to properly understand that passage in the book, they would need a literal interpretation, not a literalist interpretation. Now, think about that in the context of interpreting the Bible 2,000 to 3,000 years after it was written. We need a literal or Catholic interpretation versus literalist or fundamentalist interpretation. Many Protestants believe we are saved by faith alone, and they say Catholics believe they can work their way into heaven. How do you answer that? First, I asked them to show me where in the Catechism, the official teaching of the Catholic Church, does it teach that we can work our way into heaven. They can't because it doesn't. The Catholic Church has never taught a doctrine of salvation by works, that we can work our way into heaven. Second, I asked them to show me where in the Bible does it teach that we are saved by faith alone. They can't because it doesn't. The only place in all of Scripture where the phrase faith alone appears is in James 2.24 where it says that we are not, not justified or saved by faith alone. So one of the main pillars of Protestantism, the doctrine of salvation by faith alone, 
not only doesn't appear in the Bible, but the Bible actually says the exact opposite, that we are not saved by faith alone. Third, I ask them that if works have nothing to do with our salvation, then how come every passage in the New Testament that talks about judgment says we will be judged by our works, not by faith alone? We see this in Romans 2, Matthew 15, 1 Peter 1, and many other verses. Fourth, I ask them if we are saved by faith alone, why does 1 Corinthians 13, 13 say that love is greater than faith? Shouldn't it be the other way around? Catholics believe that we are saved by God's grace alone. We can do nothing apart from God's grace to receive the free gift of salvation. However, we have to respond to His grace. Protestants believe that too. However, many Protestants believe that the only response necessary is an act of faith, whereas Catholics believe a response of faith and works is necessary, whereas the Bible puts it in Galatians 5, 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is of any avail, but faith working through love. Faith working through love, just as the church teaches. How should I respond to someone who wants to know if I've been saved or born again? Answer with a resounding yes. Tell them that it is through baptism that you are saved, just as the Bible says in 1 Peter 3.20, and that it is through baptism, water and the Spirit, that you were born again, just as the Bible says in John 3 verse 5. Many Protestants believe that they are saved by making a single act of faith at a single point in time in their lives. Nowhere does Scripture say such a thing. Catholics believe that salvation is a process which begins with our baptism and continues throughout our lifetimes, just as the Bible teaches us. Many places in Scripture talk about how one is saved, but not one of them says we are saved by one act of faith at just one point in time. Again, 1 Peter 3.20 says that we are saved by baptism. Hebrews 12.14 says that we will not see the Lord unless we are holy, and that we must strive for this holiness. Matthew 6 verses 14 and 15, it says we must forgive others or we will not be forgiven. Can you attain salvation if God hasn't forgiven you? No. So our forgiving others is necessary for our salvation. John 6 verse 54 says that we will have eternal life by doing something, eating the flesh and drinking the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Matthew 19 verses 16 and 17, Jesus is asked directly what one must do to have eternal life. Did he say, accept me into your heart once and that's it? No. Jesus said to keep the commandments and you will have life. Yes, as Catholics we are born again, and as Catholics we believe that we were saved, as Paul says in Romans 8.24, that we are being saved, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, and that we will be saved, as Paul says in Romans 5 verses 9 and 10, provided we persevere and keep our eyes on the prize. Salvation is a process, just as Catholics believe, and just as the Bible clearly teaches. I have a friend who says that baptism is a symbolic act and that it has nothing to do with salvation. How can I answer him? Simple. Show him what the Bible says. Nowhere does the Bible say that baptism is merely a symbolic act. That passage simply does not exist. But the Bible does say this about baptism. In Ezekiel 36 verses 25 to 27 it says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you and I will put my spirit within you. Here in the Old Testament we have a foreshadowing of New Testament baptism. In the New Testament, Acts 2 verse 38, Repent and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. No symbolic language here. The book of Acts says, Be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Ezekiel says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from your uncleannesses. The book of Acts says, And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel says, And I will put my spirit within you. Do you begin to see how God in the Old Covenant was preparing us for what He gives us in the New Covenant? Acts 22:16. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. What body was that? The body of Christ. 1 Peter 3.21 Baptism which corresponds to this now saves you. Scripture simply does not support the non-Catholic notion that baptism is symbolic. Scripture does, however, very clearly and directly support the Catholic teaching that baptism saves us, that baptism makes us members of the body of Christ, that baptism washes away sin, and that through baptism we receive the Holy Spirit just as the church teaches. A friend of mine has been reading the Left Behind books. Is there really going to be a rapture like these books talk about? No. The rapture refers to a passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 where Christians are caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Many Christians believe, and the Left Behind books promote, that this being caught up to meet the Lord will occur before the Great Tribulation. Christians will simply vanish. 
meet Jesus somewhere in the air, and then return with him to heaven to await the end of time. But notice, in verse 15, Paul says that we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up. Those who are left get caught up to meet the Lord. The Left Behind books get their name from a passage in Luke 17 and one in Matthew 24 which compares the coming of the Lord to the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Matthew 24 puts it this way, As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, and they did not know until the flood came and swept them all the way. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one is taken and one is left. Two women grinding at the mill, one is taken, one is left. One is taken, one is left. The rapture, right? Jesus takes the Christians, leaves behind non-Christians. Two problems with that interpretation. First, Jesus' coming is compared to the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Well, after the flood, who was left? Noah and his family. The good guys, the bad guys were taken. After Sodom and Gomorrah went up in smoke, who was left? Lot and his daughters. The good guys, the bad guys were taken. Second problem, 1 Thessalonians 4 says that those who are left get to meet Jesus in the air. The good guys are left behind to meet Jesus. In other words, you want to be left behind so that you can get caught up in the clouds to meet Jesus in the air and accompany him back to earth at his second and final coming. There will be no rapture like the one the left behind books talk about. That view is not scriptural. The Bible clearly says that Jesus had brothers and sisters, but the Catholic Church teaches that Mary was a perpetual virgin. How can that be? Mark 6 verse 3 says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? Point number one to consider. There is no word for cousin or for nephew or for niece, aunt, uncle in ancient Hebrew or Aramaic. The words that the Jews used in all those instances were brother or sister. An example of this can be seen in Genesis 14, 14, where Lot, who was Abraham's nephew, is called his brother. Another point to consider. Would the last thing that Jesus did on earth be to grievously offend his survival? brothers. Right before Jesus dies, John 19 tells us that Jesus entrusted the care of his mother to the apostle John. If Mary had any other sons, this would have been an incredible slap in the face to them that the apostle John was entrusted with the care of their mother. Also, we see from Matthew 27, 55 and 56 that the James and Josephs mentioned in Mark 6 as the brothers of Jesus are actually the sons of another Mary. And one other passage to consider, Acts 1 verses 14 to 15 speaks of a company of about 120 persons that consist of the apostles, the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now let's see, there were 11 apostles at the time, Jesus' mother makes 12, the women, probably the same three women mentioned at the crucifixion in Matthew 27, but let's say it was maybe a dozen or two, just for argument's sake, that puts us up to 30 or 40 or so. So that leaves the number of Jesus' brothers at about 80 or 90, according to this scripture passage. Do you think Mary had 80 or 90 children? She would have been in perpetual labor. No, scripture does not contradict the teaching of the Catholic Church about the brothers of Jesus when scripture is interpreted in proper context. My Protestant friends say the Catholic Church has added a lot of man-made traditions to the Word of God. Is that true? No, it's not true. Protestants go by the written Word of God alone or sacred scripture alone. Catholics go by the entire Word of God as it is found in sacred scripture and sacred tradition. All of the Word of God was originally passed down as oral tradition. Eventually some of it was written down. This became sacred scripture or written tradition. However, Scripture itself tells us that not all the things that Jesus said and did were written down. That's where sacred tradition comes in. Paul says this about tradition. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. Traditions taught by word of mouth and traditions taught by letter. Sacred Scripture and sacred tradition. In 1 Corinthians 11.2, Paul commends them for maintaining the traditions as he has delivered them sacred scripture and sacred tradition. 2 Timothy 2 verse 2 And what you have heard from me before many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is an instance in scripture of Paul commanding the passing on of oral tradition. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 And we also thank God constantly for this that when you received the word of God which you heard from us you accepted it not as the word of men but as what it really is the word of God. They received as the word of God that which they heard, not simply that which they read in scripture. In other words, the Bible clearly supports the Catholic Church's teaching that the word of God is contained in both sacred scripture and sacred tradition.
In 1 Timothy, it says that Jesus is our sole mediator, yet we pray to Mary and the saints. Is that going against the Bible? 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 says, There is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. By praying to the saints, we're accused of going against the Bible because it seems we are making the saints mediators between God and man, not just Jesus. In the Old Testament, we see that Moses, Abraham, and Job interceded on behalf of others. That's mediating between God and man. Plus, we know that it is okay to ask others here on earth to pray and intercede for us. That's mediating between God and man. So once again, we have a situation where a passage of the Bible is being misinterpreted and misunderstood. There is only one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. But as members of the body of Christ, he allows us to share in his mediation. Scripture says that we have only one foundation, Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 3.11. But Scripture says that there is more than one foundation, Ephesians 2.19 and 20. Scripture says that we have only one Lord, Jesus Christ, Ephesians 4 verses 4 and 5. But Scripture says there is more than one Lord, Revelations 19.16. Scripture says that we have only one judge, Jesus Christ, James 4, verse 12. But Scripture tells us there is more than one judge, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2. Contradictions in Scripture? No, not when these passages are read in context. Jesus is the only foundation, Jesus is the only Lord, and Jesus is the only judge. But we are members of Jesus' body. Therefore, we are able, according to the graces given by Christ, to share in Jesus' role as foundation, as Lord and as judge, and in other aspects of Christ as well. Another example, as a father, I share in God's role as the Father by His grace. And so also the saints in heaven can and do share in Christ's role as mediator. The Bible says to call no man father. So why do we call our priests father? In Matthew 23, verse 9, it says, And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Notice that this verse makes no distinction between spiritual fathers, which is what priests are, and biological fathers. This passage says that no man is to be called father. Therefore, you cannot distinguish between calling a priest father and calling the man who is married to your mother father. But, is that actually what this passage is saying? Or is Jesus warning us against trying to usurp the fatherhood of God, which is what the Pharisees and scribes were doing? They wanted all attention focused on them. They were leaving God, the Father, out of the equation. And even if you just interpret this passage from Matthew 23 as an absolute ban against calling anyone your spiritual father, then there are some problems for you in the rest of Scripture. For example, Jesus in the story of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16 has the rich man referring to Abraham as father several times. Paul in Romans 4 refers to Abraham as the father of the uncircumcised, the Gentiles. Spiritual fatherhood, not biological fatherhood. In Acts 7 and then in Acts 22, first Stephen and then Paul refer to the Jewish priests and elders as brothers and fathers. Spiritual fatherhood. So, if you interpret Matthew 23 as saying we cannot call anyone our spiritual father, then you have to believe that Jesus, Paul, and Stephen all got it wrong. It is okay to call priests our spiritual fathers today. We are simply imitating the example given us by Jesus, Paul, and Stephen, all of whom who used the term in a spiritual sense. As long as we remember that our true father is God the Father, and that all aspects of our fatherhood, biological and spiritual, are derived from him. Why do Catholics call Mary the Queen of Heaven? Doesn't God rebuke the Israelites in the Old Testament for worshiping a false goddess called the Queen of Heaven? Should we not refer to Mary with that title, therefore, since it's a title of a false god? In Jeremiah 7 verse 18, God is indeed upset with the Israelites for worshiping a false goddess called the Queen of Heaven. However, just because God rebuked them for worshiping the false Queen of Heaven, doesn't mean that we cannot pay honor to the true Queen of Heaven, the Blessed Mother. That type of thinking would lead you to believe that just because people worship a false god that they call God, we therefore should not call the true God by that same name, God, because that's the same name the idolaters use for their God. That is faulty logic and it makes no sense whatsoever. Again, the fact that there is a false queen of heaven does not lead to the conclusion that we worship a false goddess when we call Mary the queen of heaven. Just as the fact that there is a false god does not lead to the conclusion that we worship a false god when we call our Father in heaven God. And there is a true Queen of Heaven. We see this quite clearly in Revelation 12 verse 1. And a great portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Let's see. There's a woman. She's in heaven. And she has a crown on her head. I could be wrong, but I don't think that's the cleaning lady. No, it's the true Queen of Heaven, Mary, the mother of the male child who is to rule the nations. 
We do not worship Mary. We honor her just as Jesus honors her. So there is absolutely nothing wrong from a scriptural point of view in calling Mary the Queen of Heaven and in honoring her just as Jesus honors her. After all, if Jesus is the King, then Mary is truly the Queen Mother of Heaven. In Romans chapter 3, it says that none is righteous and that all have sinned. But the Catholic Church teaches that Mary is without sin. How can that be? Romans 3 verse 10 says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. Yet James 5.16 says that the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If absolutely no one is righteous, then who is James talking about? Luke chapter 1 says that Elizabeth and Zechariah were righteous before God. If absolutely no one is righteous, then how can that be? Is scripture contradicting itself? No, the folks who interpret Romans as saying absolutely without exception no one is righteous are misinterpreting that passage. They are failing to realize that the key to understanding Romans 3.10 is the phrase, It is written. Here in Romans, Paul is quoting from the Old Testament, Psalm 14 to be exact. In Psalm 14 it says, The fool says in his heart there is no God. They are corrupt. There is none that does good. But then that same psalm goes on to talk about the righteous. Well, if none has done good, who are the righteous people the psalm is talking about? Obviously, when the psalmist says that none is good, he is talking about the fools who say there is no God. He is not talking about absolutely everyone. Just so Paul, when he quotes from the psalm, Paul is not saying absolutely no one is righteous. If he was, then how do you explain all the Old and New Testament passages that refer to the righteous? In Romans 3.11, it says that no one seeks for God. Does that mean that absolutely no one is seeking God? No, to interpret it that way would be ludicrous. Just so, verse 23, which says that all have sinned. Babies haven't sinned, have they? Little children haven't sinned, have they? No, this is not an absolute. There are exceptions. So it is perfectly legitimate to say that these passages from Romans, when interpreted in context, in no way conflict with the church's teaching on Mary being without sin. Why do Protestants not believe John 6 when it says that Jesus' flesh is real food and that his blood is real drink? I don't know. In Matthew 26, Mark 14, and Luke 22, Jesus says of the bread, This is my body. He says of the wine, This is my blood. Not this is symbolic of, or this represents. He says this is. In John 6, he repeats himself like he does nowhere else in Scripture to emphasize the fact that he expects us to eat his flesh and drink his blood and that his flesh is real food and that his blood is real drink. Anyone who says he is speaking symbolically and not literally simply is refusing to look at all the facts. Fact number one, the Jews took him literally. We see that in verse 52. Fact number two, his disciples took him literally. We see that in verse 60. Fact number three, the apostles took him literally. Verses 67 to 69. If everyone who heard him speak at the time took him literally, then my question is, why does anyone today, 2,000 years after the fact, take him symbolically? Also, in verse 51 of John 6, Jesus says that the bread which he will give for the life of the world is his flesh. When did he give his flesh for the life of the world? On the cross. Was that symbolic? If you think Jesus is speaking symbolically here when he says that we must eat his flesh and drink his blood, then you must also conclude that Jesus' death on the cross was only symbolic. It wasn't really Jesus hanging up there. It was symbolic flesh and symbolic blood. Jesus is clearly talking about the flesh that he gave for the life of the world. He did that on the cross. Those who believe he is talking symbolically here in John 6 have a real problem when it comes to John 6 verse 51. Did Jesus give us his real flesh and blood for the life of the world? Or was it only his symbolic flesh and blood? To learn more, listen to John Martinoni every Monday on Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. You can get a free copy of Two Minute Apologetics on CD or tape just by logging on to www.biblechristiansociety.com or write to us at Bible Christian Society, P.O. Box 424, Pleasant Grove, Alabama, 35127. 